Okay, so hello and welcome to the panel discussion. This is um, devoted to the special issue of the Journal of Health Politics, Policy and Law on EU health policy. Um, I'd like to just introduce very briefly our speakers before passing over to them. So um, firstly, Professor Catherine Fieldberg from Dalhousie, Dr. Thomas Sokol from the Zagreb School of Economics and Management, also an MEP of course, Professor Tamara Harvey from Sheffield, Professor Dr. Sinberg Martinson from Copenhagen, uh, Dr. Reini Schramer from now at Radbart in Nijmegen, Dr. Olga Lovlova from Cambridge, Dr. Bruno Nikolic from Ljubljana, and Dr. Eleanor Brooks from Edinburgh. Of course, all our speakers are well known for their work in a range of areas, and we're very grateful and happy today that they could take some time out to come and talk about particular papers published in this special issue. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Professor Catherine Fieldberg to introduce the project. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, I am absolutely delighted to be beaming in from a continent away in, or, in, in order to be able to join the session. Uh, one of the few upsides of the pandemic is that living online has actually created the capacity for the globalization of local discussions. Uh, this set of papers is the product of a workshop in Copenhagen back in the days when we took travel for granted. And the panel workshop in turn is part of a larger uh, Jean Monnet network project back in the day when the UK was still part of Erasmus+. Plus. Uh, we were supposed to be presenting these papers at a panel uh, in Brussels last May, but the, the, the timing was obviously not fortuitous. We are, however, very grateful for uh, to Mary for hosting this in an online format. Uh, the topic, the nature of healthcare within a larger European context, is one that is continually evolving. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion. So again, Mary, thank you very much for hosting this. Okay, thank you, Catherine. It's a pleasure to welcome you all today. Um, I'm going to start by asking um, Dr. Tomislav Sokol to um, speak briefly about his paper, The Effect of EU Integration on Healthcare in Central and Eastern Europe. So the floor is yours, Tomislav. Thank you, Mary, uh, very, very much. I'm also very delighted to be here in this uh, dis distingu distinguished panel. Of course, what I what I have to, what I have to say is um, it's always it's always hard for me to speak uh, briefly. You know, we as politicians, we like to speak a lot, so I'll but I'll try to really focus on most uh, important uh, pieces of my paper. And uh, just one caveat at the beginning, uh, of course, since the whole uh, procedure as in all top journals, uh, the review the review procedure lasted for a bit of time. I'm not sure if all of the things that are mentioned in my paper are quite up to date because I started writing the paper before the multi-annual financial framework was adopted, but I'll, uh, so definitely some things have changed in the meantime. I tried to include some of them in the reviewing stage in the in, in the last minute, but I'll try to, uh, some things which are not in the paper, I'll try to mention them uh, verbally now in the in my presentation. So my topic is about uh, effects of uh, EU integration on healthcare in Central and Eastern Europe. Of course, Central and Eastern Europe, you know, that uh, jo uh, joined, m many member states joined in 2004, others in 2007, and Croatia was the last one in 2013. So in, in all, I tried to analyze and find some common developments in, th in 11 countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Which, of course, brings me to my first conclusion is that it's very hard to, uh, to find the commonalities in such a large, num big number of different member states with different healthcare systems, different traditions, different financial possibilities, which are now definitely not the same in Estonia, Czech Republic, Slovenia and Bulgaria, for instance. So uh, I have to say this in the beginning. So, But I tried to find some, com some commonalities. But as I said, in, there are many different national contexts and, of course, in different national contexts, different reasons for certain measures, etc. So I divide my paper into three mo uh, major parts. So first, uh, about free movement of uh, professionals, free movement of patients, and uh, EU economic and fiscal governance uh, mechanisms and their influence on access to healthcare, which I think is very important. And I chose these three areas because these are the areas where, in my opinion, EU has had the strongest influence uh, 
in terms of uh, its health in, in terms of national healthcare policies, so influence of EU on the in, on the national level, and these are the areas where EU has the strongest competence to act because we know that you know that uh, EU competences in the area of public health are very limited. Most of the competences and powers belong to the member states, so these are the areas where EU has had the strongest legislative and budgetary role to play. So first, when we speak about uh, economic governance. Of course, uh, we can say that in general, the influence of EU has been mixed. So, of course, uh, so EU has very strong tools which have been strengthened during the economic crisis of 2010, 2011, uh, like uh, um, excessive deficit procedure, memorandums of understanding, uh, country specific uh, recommendations, European semester set, even though memorandums of understanding are specific, but they are also, at least to some extent, can be considered to be an EU instrument. So, in general, what can be said in terms of access to healthcare and EU influence is that uh, overall, if you look at the situation in the, in the Central Eastern Europe from acceding to the EU, that the general situation has, has improved in terms of uh, health infrastructure, in terms of uh, reduction of unmet medical needs due to in, due to due to prices that, that that have to be paid so in general they have they have so so these problems have decreased or in other words access to healthcare has improved since entering the eu of course not all of the we can discuss in detail about each member state why this has happened so it's not just about because of the eu policies and which eu policies but in overall some some connections definitely can be can be seen however of course eu economic governance instruments has Play the role in some member states of uh, decreasing the level, decreasing access to healthcare, of um, make, making making access to healthcare worse, or slowing the this progress that has been visible since succeeding exceeding to the to the EU. Of course, uh, the, of, uh, so this is this is kind of a, this is kind of a general general conclusion. And of course, things have, uh, and of course, one of the main reasons why economic crisis has had this impact, and EU instruments have had this impact on national member healthcare systems, is because of the EU of the, of the focus on financial austerity. And and one of the conclusions of the paper is that EU's instruments, EU powers in the area of financial control, fiscal control, deficit control, austerity, are much stronger than in the, than in the areas of facilitating access to healthcare. And this has def this has definitely shown. Of course, EU economic uh, governance mechanisms have evolved over time, especially European semester. And if you look at the country specific recommendations, which eight or ten, eight or nine years ago were really focused on austerity, on fiscal discipline, etc., now these, the things have really begun began to change. So there are be, so a lot of health outcomes. Objectives which are inherently related, and part of healthcare systems like uh, better better health outcomes, better access to better access to healthcare, especially for vulnerable populations. So all of these things have become part also of the European semester in the meantime. But still, the this constitu uh, constitutional symmetry in the EU still exists. That much strong instruments it has on disposal to regulate fiscal deficit, fiscal discipline, etc., and much and much weaker possibilities to much weaker possibilities to uh, facilitate access to healthcare. The main instrument that has been at its disposal is, the, of course, the budget, the cohesion policy, which has really helped, especially in some member states, to improve access to healthcare. So this was the first, the first part. The second part is about free movement of healthcare professionals. So we know the stories about the big outflows of healthcare professionals from Central and Eastern Europe to the West. I tried to find some data, and data actually really shows that that we can we can observe a ge geographic pattern of medical professionals uh, going to, to work and live from Central and Eastern Europe to the Western and Northern parts of the EU. Of course, the main reason for this is that we have the, the rules on free freedom of establishment, free movement of services and free movement of per workers, which allows both employed and self-employed health professionals to go and work and live in other member states. And of course, the big differences in terms of possibility of working conditions, the sal and salaries, etc., partly re partly because of the austerity measures imposed by the member by the member states, because a lot of these austerity measures were uh, related to a decrease in salaries, and all of this has led to the to outflow of healthcare professionals to west and the north. Of course, uh, the biggest outflow, which is very important, happened just in the first two year year or first two years after exceeding to the EU. So after the time with 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 the passing of time, these uh, these uh, outflows have uh, have 
kind of slowed down, and in some cases they even came around because because in some some member states have introduced new measures which which allowed them and made it possible for them to get healthcare professionals to come back to return to their national healthcare systems, which is very important because a lot because this this free movement of healthcare professionals have really led in some member states to really use um, important use up important retention strategies like increase in salaries, investments into infrastructure, etc., like in Poland, Estonia, Lithuania, etc. And the last point, the last part uh, about free movement of patients. Free movement of patients is is one of the big topics. And of course, in free movement of patients, we know that this uh, that these movements are not really big in terms of numbers of patients uh, of, of patients utilizing this these possibilities. But what is also important, which I found it a bit of uh, strange, I didn't expect this, is that uh, in Central Eastern Europe you have really different patterns. In some cases, you have more patients going abroad. In some member states, you have more patients coming to be treated in those member states. So definitely in Central and Eastern Europe, you have this kind of different diverging patterns which can, which can exist. And of course, we cannot speak about really strong influence of EU free movement of patients rules in Central and Eastern uh, con European countries in this sense. But the differences in the level of healthcare spending, in the in the health outcomes, etc., still and uh, access to healthcare and different uh, uh, levels of development of health infrastructure may, uh, may cause this patterns to change. So this is something that definitely needs to be needs to be looked at. So my and my conclusions, and then I'll stop because I think I'm pretty out of time, is that still big differences exist. So Central and Eastern Europe in terms of access to healthcare, infrastructure, possibilities to pay healthcare workers, health professionals are still much different when compared to other parts of the EU. And this has, of course, led to some some uh, to to some movements like movements of healthcare professionals, etc. And this this of course has created problems in some of the least developed parts of the Central and Eastern Europe. On the other hand, also EU economic governance instruments have have had an adverse effect to access to healthcare in some parts of Central and Eastern Europe. But the overall, I can say that overall level of economic development and convergence which uh, because part to a large extent because of the EU cohesion policy which has really uh, helped uh, reduce disparities between different member states has definitely had a role to play in generally overall help uh, increasing possibilities to access health health care in this in these countries uh, so the conclusion there is that st that the influence of EU in this sense in terms of strong legal powers has been mixed so in terms of economic governance, austerity, etc., but and possibilities, but and EU influence in terms of facilitating still access to healthcare has been not because of regulatory powers, not because of regulatory competences of the EU, but because of the EU budget, which has been used to a big extent to de reduce disparities between different member states. So, so and of course this has shown that still in terms of regulatory competences of the EU, the biggest powers lie in the area of fiscal and economic governance, and in terms of actually facilitating healthcare, access to healthcare, patient rights, etc., is still the biggest powers uh, rest with the member states. The political atmosphere has changed in this sense in the last several years, and the biggest change has been because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, so uh, I can say uh, as being a member of the European Parliament that, uh, that healthcare, which was before discussed as something very marginal in terms of EU activities, EU policies, has now really become a center of attention. And a lot of things which were unheard of before, which are, which could not be, which could, uh, which which was completely so, something that uh, that could not be expected, are uh, that to be discussed on the EU level are now being discussed, like joint, joint, joint procurement of medicines, like strengthening EU, inst, EU institutions, uh, influencing and, and investing into into prevention mechanism, early screening, detection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a lot of a lot of new policy activities and a lot of new policy actions on the EU level are now influencing healthcare, and I expect that this influence on Central and Eastern Europe will be much bigger. And one of the uh, signs of this new development is the EU budget. And of course, you know that the problem with EU budget is that the seven-year budget is adopted by way of unanimity. So it's enough that you have several uh, member states to, or one member states to block it. So of course, an, a compromise had to be reached. But the final compromise is in the end that much more money will be allocated for healthcare in EU budget than before. And especially, I would like to mention here EU for Health program, which is uh, which is 12 times times bigger in terms of uh, money allocation than the last health program in the last seven years. So it was 440 million euros, now it's 5.4 billion euros. It would have been much bigger if not 
uh, for the opposition of some member states. So definitely EU, now EU healthcare in the EU has become much more, more important. It has become part, part of the policy focus, mostly because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And all of these policy instruments and new developments can be used to reduce these disparities which exist between West on one side and Central and Eastern Europe on the other side. So, and I'll stop here. Okay, th thank you, Thomas. Hopefully we can pick up on some of those um, themes you've mentioned um, in the discussion as well. That's great. Uh, I'd like to turn now to Professor Tamara Harvey, um, who was involved in the paper entitled he Health Brexternalities, the Brexit effect on healthcare outside the UK. So over to Tammy. Thank you, Mary. Um, I hope you can hear me now. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, th and thank you so much for organising this. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's really lovely to see everybody. OK, so my paper is about Brexit, uh, that awful subject. Um, and uh, it is about not the effects on uh, health in the UK of Brexit, because they are grim, and we've covered those in lots of other papers. They're, it's about the effects of Brexit on health outside of the UK. And um, what, uh, uh, what I do in the paper is I talk about um, the effects in terms of what Kenneth Armstrong has called Brexternalities. So a Brexternality is an external um, effect of Brexit that is more severe than a, a mere, mere repercussion because it has implications for legitimacy and accountability. So um, an externality is an effect of a, a law or policy decision which excludes those who are affected by the law or policy decision and those excluding effects have the effect of delegitimating the decision made in the context of what is supposed to be a democratic set of decision making processes. Um, and of course, uh, uh, the, the decision to, to leave the EU is kind of an ultimate uh, externality uh, in terms of, of the, the lack of legitimacy of that decision. But I'm, I won't go into more detail on that just now. So what the paper does is it looks at um, the external effects of Brexit on health, and it looks at them in a temporally and a spatially differentiated way. So thinking about the spatially differentiated way, which is the only one I'll have time to cover in my five minutes allotted, um, there are some member states where the effects on health of Brexit are significantly worse than others in in terms of their geographical proximity or their connectivity with the UK in health domains. And of course, the number one member state that's badly affected is Ireland. But actually, what has happened since we wrote the paper is that the legal and policy environment has actually changed quite significantly with First of all, the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland protocol, which effectively keeps Northern Ireland in the single market in terms of products, uh, not entirely, but it really makes a big difference in terms of health products. And secondly, the um, future relationship, the trade and cooperation agreement has maintained some of the aspects of health, across border health, with respect to people. And in addition, the legal context on the island of Ireland includes keeping the common travel area and keeping the Good Friday Agreement. So what we are expecting in the medium term is that the effects of Brexit on health in Ireland will not be as bad as they would have been if these legal instruments ha did not exist. If there had been a no deal Brexit, then it would have been much worse for Ireland. But there are other countries that are negatively affected. Um, Spain is one because there is a big concentration of uh, British citizens retired in Spain who use the Spanish healthcare system. Another is Malta, which is closely uh, integrated with the UK in terms of both training of medical professionals and medicine supply. Uh, 
And another area is, and this relates to um, the previous paper, is Central and Eastern Europe, because um, that's a place where um, traditionally um, medical professional capacity building involved the UK. So I'm just coming to the end of my allotted five minutes. Um, and what I want to conclude by saying is that actually the analysis in this paper is to some extent now redundant. And what we need to do is we need to do some careful analysis of the new trade and cooperation agreement between the EU and the UK in terms of what that means in the health domain. And that's the work that I'll be doing um, in the next few months. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Tammy. So, um, moving on with different themes now, obviously they're highlighting the need that the topics we cover are very much um, undergoing development and likely to be revisited from different perspectives as things develop at uh, national and EU levels politically as well. So, the next paper we have uh, Professor Dorterson Berg Martinson and Dr. Raini Schramer. And their paper is entitled Networked Healthcare Governance in the EU. So over to Dorta and Raini, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you for organizing this and also to Catherine for organizing the special issue. It's it's all great here. So I'll just start and then Raini will take over. So um, our uh, paper examines a different aspect of healthcare governance, one could say, than what we at least see traditionally done in, in the field. Uh, it looks into networked healthcare governance. And this is part of a larger um, research project where we compare uh, the use of European administrative networks across uh, several policy fields. There, healthcare is one of them that we look into. And uh, our main uh, engagement motivation for going to this field is that we tend to study monitoring compliance and enforcement of EU rules by focusing in particular on the Commission or on the European Court of Justice. But what we actually see is that the EU is making increasingly use of uh, new forms of governance uh, to establish unified health policies. Um, and that is also in relation specifically to implementation of uh, EU policies at the national level and also in enforcing these uh, policies. Um, so we see that EU agencies and committees are increasingly important in EU healthcare governance as part of the toolbox of steering compliance. Um, and uh, this is uh, what we look uh, into in this paper in specifically looking into European administrative networks. So these are uh, networks consisting of uh, civil servants that in some way or the other deals with um, implementation and enforcement of EU law. Um, and these also exist uh, quite considerably in the healthcare area. And, um, and um, we here see that they have an important role in ensuring um, standards, European standards, uh, and in um, also developing European uh, practices. But what is, um, we argue, characteristic of the field of studying EU and healthcare governance is that their, their role, and in particular their impact, is largely unexplored. Um, we do not know very much about what competences do they have, these networks, uh, how do they function, how do they operate internally in terms of their structure, and, uh, and um, how are they mandated by politicians and eventually interact uh, with political context. So these are some of the themes that we engage uh, with in this project and also in this um, paper specifically. So first we provide an overview of um, how the development of European administrative networks have been in the field of, of healthcare. And we show that they have grown um, uh, considerably over time and they are actually quite numerous when we look uh, in the health uh, area. And we then look specifically into two um, networks operating in the field. And this is over to you, Reini, to present. 
Yes, so I'll take over here. So we, yeah, so we have two networks in healthcare, uh, but two very different networks. So we have the uh, pharma risk, um, uh, pharma, pharma convenience risk assessment committee and the cross-border healthcare expert network. And we see that there's far more political support for the uh, pharma, uh, from a convenience network that's part of the EMA. It's, it's much better staffed, it's more supranational, so there's more contact with the commission and has much more competences. Uh, while the cross-border healthcare network is more much more of an information network. And so we use social network analysis to, to map out the interactions that go on uh, among the members in these networks. Uh, and this will give us insight in the network structure and the position of the various uh, member states uh, in the network. So we basically asked, we had a survey of all the national representatives in the network um, and asked them to rank the five most, uh, the five network members their organization was most frequently in contact with. So this contact could mean uh, general discussion, um, exchange of views, as well as uh, more informal advice. And then we use a social network analysis to on um, this data. So first of all, we see that uh, that uh, pharma convenience network is relatively dense. So this is pr probably due to the, the very uh, uh, complex uh, issues they're dealing with with pharma convenience. Um, and this demands continuous activity, basically, um, to handle these issues. And we also see that the network is very centralized. So um, the, this means that the power of the members varies considerably. So we have the Netherlands, the United Kingdom and Germany at the very center of the network. Um, and uh, we see also that uh, those with also those member states that have the most specialized expertise in uh, pharma convenience on certain uh, substances, for example, or medicines, um, they are the most active in the network. So we see that both um, expertise and influence over the network actually uh, is concentrated in Western and Northern member states. Um, when we go, when we look at the cross-border healthcare network, um, interaction are slightly less dense, and uh, it's also a very different context cross-border healthcare network is operating in. So they only meet every six months, um, and they deal with implementation in a relatively stable environment. Um, but this network is also uh, centralized, similar to the pharma convigilance network. So we see an unequal distribution of contacts across members. So again, Germany at the center, uh, Spain, but also Slovakia and the Czech Republic. And we see, interesting enough, we see that it's not that the members that um, are, uh, so we see that the members that are actually most active in the network are not at all convinced that this network um, improves the ability of uh, taking up healthcare in another member state. And, we, and also we do not see that these active members are have the most experience with the application of the directive. And thirdly, we do not see that um, it's actually the members that indicate that uh, this network uh, is in fact improving taking up healthcare in, uh, abroad. Um, these are actually rather at the periphery of the network. So it's not the perceived effectiveness of the network, it's not the experience of granting um, patients to take healthcare in another member state, um, which affects active participation in the network. So and we in actually also don't find that interactions reflect the number of patient mobility. So um, this network is, uh, not really um, functioning as a network to improve cross-border healthcare utilization, but it's more useful to sort of mitigate the impact of the directive on their healthcare systems. So member states such as Germany, Spain, and Czech Republic, which take up um, many patients from other member states, they are the most active. So the sheer impact of the directive on their healthcare system may have caused them to become more active in the network. So to conclude, um, this is interesting because it shows that actually these small administrative bodies um, perform not only an integrative function in the EU, but they can also uh, perform a protective function uh, for national interests. And I'd like to conclude here.
Okay, thank you very much, Dorta and Mahoney, for that interesting interaction um, between sort of national and EU levels there. Um, we'll move on now to Olga, who's talking about health technology assessment and healthcare reimbursement in the EU. So over to you, Olga. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, that's fine. Fantastic. Hi. So yes, I'll be talking about uh, my paper that deals with the Europeanization or, or harmonization of health technology assessment. Um, health technology assessment, what is it? Um, it's uh, an evaluation of the value for money, in air quotes, of health technologies. And by health technology, we mean not only devices and diagnostics, but also pharmaceuticals and surgical, mental health, other interventions. Health Technology Assessment, or HTA, um, basically evaluates the economic, clinical, social, ethical, organizational, and other consequences of uh, new health technologies being introduced into the health system or clinical practice. Most EU member states uh, have dedicated HTA bodies in uh, some form um, or another, but what these bodies do and what they look like, how much staff they have, how much money they have, that differs quite a lot. Um, but essentially, HTA is an evaluation that's used to inform decisions on whether new technologies should be um, funded uh, from public uh, funds, from public health systems, healthcare systems, um, and how much uh, these health systems should pay for them, how much is acceptable, good value for money. This basically means that HTA is one of these dossiers or issues that are at first sight um, really boring and uh, really technical, uh, but have the potential of, uh, of having far reaching consequences for a member state's uh, social policy and welfare state. Um, and that makes it interesting. HTA actually has been on uh, the agenda in Brussels for many years, starting in the late 80s and then accelerating in the mid 2000s. Um, the Commission has been funding various initiatives uh, for national HTA experts to collaborate since basically the 80s. Um, and all of this culminates in uh, 2018, uh, when uh, when uh, DG Sante under uh, under Kaitis, um, published a uh, proposal for a regulation on HTA, and this has become the biggest and most contentious uh, dossier of uh, the Juncker Commission. There's been a stalemate uh, basically almost from the get go, or certainly after the Council and the Parliament failed to uh, agree on key points. And last month. Uh, the German presidency proposed a compromise, but we'll see where that actually takes us. So in my paper, I ask if there's actually any appetite from like among um, key European actors for further harmonization um, in HTA, and if so, where it comes from, and if not, uh, where does the potential res resistance originate? And I use um, Scott Greer's concept of uh, permissive dissensus, basically that EU policymaking is biased in a neo-functionalist uh, logic uh, toward uh, ever more integrative solutions, thanks to cultivated sp spillover of elite socialization. So yes, there is dissensus, but it's not constraining, uh, it's permissive. Nobody cares in the end. Um, I wrote the paper in 2018 uh, for the special issue based almost exclusively on uh, publicly available sources. So I don't actually have much, uh, much um, uh, juicy gossip or uh, just insight from uh, from interviews. Um, if you're looking for a juicy gossip, that is sadly I'm not uh, I'm not the person at this point. But what I did find um, is essentially the following. Um, the Commission and national HDA experts um, and the UNETA, the European Network for HDA, that's the networking collaborative um, body uh, of these experts, are obviously very much in favor of a Europeanized HDA. The Commission in particular repeatedly insisted on uh, one, the main key contentious point, the so-called mandatory uptake of joint clinical assessment. What this means is that countries should 
be free to do their own assessment when a new drugs, uh, drug uh, hits the market um, of the economics and the ethics, etc., um, but uh, not of uh, the clinical aspects of things, which should be done at, um, at an EU level and uh, countries should not be allowed to actually duplicate this assessment to do their own additional assessment. The parliament, the pharmaceutical industry, um, the patients and doctors have been um, also in favor with some minor reservations. Um, interestingly, the European Patients Forum was the only actor that openly drew the link between these procedural aspects that are um, supposed to be Europeanized um, of HTA um, and uh, the, uh, the av availability of uh, specifically medicines or um, uh, treatments or technologies um, for patients across uh, the European Union. They called uh, a Europeanized HTA a first step to reducing inequalities um, among uh, member states, inequalities of access to medicines. Um, so that was the only actor that actually drew this conclusion. The main opposition came from the medical device industry, uh, which uh, basically um, wants to avoid um, regulation, um, and the member states, especially national healthcare payers, um, but also at, at a higher level uh, in the member states. Um, the objections were basically based on uh, issues of sovereignty and subsidiarity. They also mentioned somehow the scientific quality of the joint assessments. Will, will these assessments be any good if they're done, for instance, by Slovakia? Um, Germany and France have been the most uh, vocal opponents of Europeanized HTA, which is why this uh, German presidency uh, compromise might be significant. Um, but uh, but there have been other um, countries uh, very much against uh, very much against the mandatory uptake and further harmonization. Um, what is interesting in conclusion is essentially that the member states and other actors um, clearly understand, obviously, the potential consequences of um, of a harmonized uh, HTA for European welfare states, especially the, the national healthcare payers understand this. But no one seems keen to politicize the issue and to actually draw the link uh, overtly. No one is really talking about it openly. So I find that very interesting. Um, if there is a compromise, we actually, together with this fact that um, this is kind of bubbling under the surface, this issue, um, we might conclude that indeed there is um, to census, but it is uh, it is after all very permissive. Thank you. That's about it for me. Okay. Thank you, Olga. Um, moving on to Bruno now, um, who's talking about the applicability of EU competition law to healthcare providers. Thank you, Mary. Do you hear me? Uh, yes, can hear you fine. And thank you for organizing this panel. Uh, I'm not a politician. I will try to be shorter, even though uh, Tomislav, you have my vote if I would vote in Croatia, of course. Let me lay out my uh, more or less technical topic and put it in a broader context of this special issue. Uh, and I will not discuss technical aspects of my research, but rather give more emphasis on conclusions. The article analyzes relevant decisions by the Commission and the court case law in pursuit of so-called boundaries that may trigger the applicability of competition law only with regard to the healthcare providers and not with regard to financing of healthcare, for instance, health insurances and, and similar. Uh, there are two reasons why this subject uh, is and will be relevant in the future, which I highlight in the beginning of the article. First one is ever increasing health spending, which according to future projections continues to outpace economic growth and will further endanger the financial sustainability of health systems. A uh, crisis which we experienced in last decade from sovereign debt crisis to migration crisis and present COVID-19 crisis are even worsening this whole situation. In a quest to strengthen the sustainability of the public health system, member states will probably continue to employ even more market-based mechanisms to provision of health services and the introduction of such mechanisms leads to a greater exposure to the application of the EU competition law, which brings us to the second main reason, which is the lack of a clear definition in EU legislation about the applicability and scope of competition law, which is determined on a case-by-case -case basis 
And this reveals an inconsistent approach by the European Commission and the courts regarding the application of competition law to healthcare providers. I emphasize merely on healthcare providers because this was the scope of my paper. This creates legal uncertainty regarding the applicability of competition law, which is not only a theoretical, but also a practical concern. So the main aim of the article is to propose a set of principles or guidelines for determining whether a healthcare provider should be considered an undertaking and as such subject to the competition law, thus eliminating those legal uncertainties. The article first defines the concept of an undertaking based on functional approach and proceeds with the analysis in which it divides healthcare providers into three different categories. First one is private healthcare providers, second is private healthcare providers that perform activities in the public health system. Those are providers with authorizations, accreditation or concessions depending on the member states and their system. And the last group are public healthcare providers. Uh, with the aim to examine whether they are considered undertakings based on the Commission's decisions and the relevant Court of Justice of EU, EU case law. So the analysis revealed that private healthcare providers and private healthcare providers that perform activities in a public health system are considered undertakings for the purpose of competition law. The approach by the EU institutions is consistent in both cases. However, the analysis, uh, the analysis revealed a different situation with regard to public healthcare providers. It revealed two different approaches taken by the Commission and the Court, which ultimately led to different outcomes. In the Fenning case, famous Fenning case, the Court established an approach which basically departed from its previous approach taken in cases concerning private, uh, concerning private, private health providers. As a result, the uh, Court did not consider Spanish uh, public hospitals to be undertakings. In the subsequent Iris H case, EU institutions returned to the previous approach and decided that Belgian public hospitals are considered undertakings. In the most recent case, which was also analyzed in the article concerning Italian public hospitals, uh, that is still pending before the general court. Uh, I think that oral hearing was at the end of the September and judgment is still in writing. The Commission returned to the approach from the Fanning case and decided that Italian public hospitals are not considered undertakings for the purpose of competition law. Based on this analysis, the article proposes a set of principles, and I will not go into the technical aspects, that would help in determining whether public health care providers should be considered undertakings and would prevent further ambiguities caused by different approaches. It proposed a two-step approach consisting of separate classification of each activity performed by the entity and accurate assessment of constituent elements that determine the economic nature of each activity or provision of each type of health service provided. Based on these principles, public health care providers would not be considered undertakings where, firstly, provider uh, of certain type of health service is exclusively state, meaning, of course, public providers. And secondly, if these providers are financed entirely from public funds, uh, basically from taxation or social insurance. In contrast, if de facto competition is perceived on the market of provision of certain health services, not just potential provision, uh, potential competition, because this raises a question of excludability of provision of health services, specific health services, which greatly increases the scope of competition law, public health care providers performing these health services would be considered undertakings in relation to the provision of these services. To conclude, of course, this does not mean that certain national regulatory interventions and financial assistance in the meaning of state aid could not be in line with competition law. It could still be justified under the Article 107, uh, Paragraph 1 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU and the Service of General Economic Interest Exemption, of course. These exceptions allow member states to intervene in their healthcare system or healthcare pro providers, for that sake, in line with their political aspirations, despite the fact that they are considered undertakings engaged in economic activity. For those who would like to, to dig in more into the technical aspect of my research, I welcome you all to, to read my article. Thanks, Mary, for giving me time. Okay, thank you, Bruno. Um, I might be coming back to you on some of the technical stuff at some point. Um, final speaker on the panel is um, Dr. Eleanor Brooks from Edinburgh, who's presenting a paper she wrote with 
um, Scott Greer, Termites of Solidarity in the House of Austerity. And we have a slide. Thank you, Mary. Um, thank you for having us. And thanks also again to Catherine for team leading such a such a super special issue. So never one to miss an opportunity for a cartoon. Uh, I have a small slide. Um, <laughs> thanks for sharing. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is co-authored between myself um, and Scott Greer at Michigan, who many of you know and love. Um, we are on a similar sort of topic area to Thomas Lab, and Thomas Lab has saved me some time explaining the European semester. So the semester is the the EU's sort of governance framework for ensuring macroeconomic stability and, and budgetary discipline. And, and, and Thomas Lab explained also that this has changed over time, right? So at the beginning, the focus was very much on budgetary austerity and from a healthcare perspective on financial sustainability, and that those things have sort of softened a little over time. And many of us will know of the body of literature that talks about a sort of socialization of the semester, right? The idea that it has become more um, aware of, of its social impacts and has started to build these in a little more. And I guess Scott and I started from a position of agreeing with some of the findings of that literature, but perhaps not perceiving so much that the semester has become something that we can use to achieve health and social objectives, but, but a little more that the semester is being weakened by its inclusion of these objectives. So we, we recognise the same dynamic, but perhaps would characterise what it's doing a little differently. And that's what our paper tries to do. So the core argument is that the opponents of the semester are successfully managing to undermine it. So Scott came up with this neat analogy of termites. So the house in our analogy is the European semester, this framework that was built by the EU to try and achieve macroeconomic stability. And the termites in our analogy are what we're broadly labelling sort of EU health and social actors. So some of those are going to be actors from within the Commission, from the sort of what we would label the excluded DGs who were not initially involved very closely in the semester, but also their sort of counterparts within the Council and, and other EU institutions and indeed the Parliament um, and civil society as well. So that's sort of where the analogy sits. What we've done in the paper is, is explore the three techniques that we think we can identify for how this group of actors is managing to undermine the semester. Um, so I'll go through those one by one and just explain a little bit about what we mean. So the first technique that these actors have used um, is this idea of adding and redefining goals. So if we think about the semester as a whole, that the goal of it originally was macroeconomic stability. It was budgetary austerity, as Thomas Lab was explaining. In the last round, or the round before, that's the 2018 round, I think was the first round where there was a quote unquote special emphasis on implementing the European pillar of social rights. That's quite a marked move from simply, simply focusing on budgetary austerity. So, so we sort of trace this evolution of the goals of the semester or the stated goals of the semester. Similarly, the annual growth survey, so the, the, the survey that kicks off the whole thing, if you like, where, where the EU, uh, where the Commission sets out what it sees as the sort of challenges facing the European economy. That that's no longer the AGS, it's now the AG, uh, hang on, it's the Sustainable Growth Service, it must be ASGS. <laughs> They've now changed the acronym to make it all about sustainable growth instead of just about growth. So there's this real evolution of trying to offset a little bit the focus on, on the economy over health and social aspects. Within health itself, again, Thomas, I've alluded to this, that some of the earlier um, country specific recommendations were very much focused in sort of 2011, 12, 13, on healthcare sustainability, right, on the sustainability of financing and how much money governments were spending on healthcare. If you fast forward to the latter sets of CSRs, we start to see discussion of universal health coverage, of health equity. It's much more holistic. It's much more acknowledging of the fact that it, it probably isn't particularly helpful from a health and social objective to talk only about the money, essentially. Um, so the paper sort of walks through how those those goals have been added to and redefined and shaped in a way that better serves the interests of our termites. The second technique we talk about is this idea that we've taken from Schatzneider from the work that was done in the 60s around um, expanding the scope of conflict. And by this, we're mostly talking about adding players. So involving more and more people in this process. So when the semester started, it was mostly under the control of DG ECFIN, of the Directorate for Economic and Financial Affairs, uh, and colleagues in the employment uh, and the tax directorates. What's happened, I think, is sort of two things, broadly speaking. So firstly, the Juncker Commission relocated control pretty much to the SEC gen. It's a little bit more nuanced than that, but, but a lot of the control over how the semester is run has moved to the SEC gen, which has taken the pen away a little bit from DG ECFIN. The second thing that's happened is that the termites sort of working together have managed to include themselves and their colleagues much more in the process. 
So DG Sante, the health uh, directorate, but also DG Regio and, and some of the others are now included much more closely within the council. The EPSCO has really started to take a leading role in the semester, whereas before it had not really involved them. <clears throat> excuse me, and they've brought along with them the Social Protection Committee and the Employment Committee and, and much more of the work in the council on the semester is now done by these actors. Civil society similarly has put together the Semester Alliance and more or less effectively is now involving itself in the semester process in a way that it didn't at the beginning. So what we're mapping in that section of the paper is really this expansion of, of the number of players involved in the semester process and some of the fractions, uh, sorry, the factions that that generates and the sort of different interests that that means have to be taken account and how that develops conflict in a way that essentially starts to undermine the process itself. And then the final technique that we're talking about is indicators, which is probably the one that looks least exciting, but that we really went to town on. And there's sort of pages and pages in the paper, I noticed as I was reading back through it, that are just about lots and lots of indicators that don't really mean anything at first glance. But essentially, we started from a situation where when health was taken into account at all, the indicator that was used was sort of top line health expenditure. You know, these countries are spending too much on health. That's sort of worrying from a budgetary and a stability perspective. And therefore, you know, you'll get a recommendation to rein that spending in. Again, fast forward to sort of 2018-19 and the, the last set of recommendations that we were looking at and the indicators have just exploded. They've really multiplied and now we're taking account of healthy life years, of out-of-pocket expenditure, of, of all sorts of things um, that, that were not there originally. The mechanisms that have been used there are mostly about critiquing the indicators that exist. So saying, look, expenditure is a blunt instrument by which to try and assess what's happening in health systems. You need something more nuanced Then drawing on indicators that exist elsewhere. So a lot of the ones that have been brought in have come from things like um, the scoreboards that are run by the Social Protection Committee, for instance, to keep track of the sort of Europe 2020 goals. They all have indicators either developed or in development. So it's been a case of bringing those in and saying we should be using these since we already have them as part of the, the semester process. Um, so the mechanisms there are quite interesting and there's quite a lengthy evolution of how the various scoreboards and dashboards of indicators have evolved over time. It's all very complicated, uh, but terribly exciting. So worth looking into. Um, so I think that's the sort of the main three techniques that we've identified. What we conclude is that, that essentially what we're seeing is policy feedback generating these things. So you set up a nice clear looking governance architecture like the semester and you say this is what it's seeking to achieve. We're seeking to achieve macroeconomic stability. So we're going to measure, involve these guys and measure spending. And what happens is that as people start to feed back into that process, the goals become much hazier, they're much more vague, there's more of them. The relationships between the actors become perhaps more tense and you're trying to take account of more, more views and, and more interest and the data becomes much more complex and therefore much harder to interpret clearly and to sort of draw clear directions um, and purposes from. And um, so that's sort of what we conclude is, is happening. The result of that, we argue, is that the semester loses its effectiveness. It's not really working very well for macroeconomic stability because it simply does try to do too much. It's now an all encompassing framework that's attempting to say something and to direct pretty much every policy area going right. Everything is now encompassed under this umbrella um, and that that sort of reduces its effectiveness quite inevitably. What's happened since sort of feeds into our, our very bottom conclusion, which is that this is an example of policy cycling of the idea that we start with one architecture when it doesn't work very well. It, it, you know, it inevitably spirals in this way where it gets bigger and less effective. And then the guys that originally built it will try to step away and rebuild it somewhere else in a slightly different form. And then the same process will happen again. So we make that argument referring back to the BEPGs and all of the things that underpinned the original semester. I noticed since and, and Scott and I had discussed that since we, we wrote the paper, actually, we're now seeing because of these recovery and resilience plans, the same thing happening again in the aftermath of COVID. COVID. So the RRPs will come in next year, I think, or maybe this, oh, no, it must be this year for this cycle of the semester to, to temporarily, in quotes, replace elements of the semester. So there won't be country reports now, there will be reports that are focused on member states' plans for how they're going to spend the money that's coming from the from the recovery package in, in the post-COVID period. So I think it feeds in, I haven't looked into it in enough detail yet, but I think it feeds in quite well to what we were anticipating towards the end of the paper and we'll make an interesting case study for, for whether we found something useful, I suppose. Um, so I'll leave it there um, so that we've got lots of time for questions. Thanks, Mary. Okay. Thank you, Ellie. Right, I'll stop the recording now.